Uh, greetings to everybody out there. I know this is a recording. This is part of our um, uh, LBC's uh, uh, winter spring webinar series. And uh, my name is Matt Eby and I'm a regional manager of support services. I'm based here in Christchurch, South Island. And today, and when you hear this, well, I can tell you it's been an absolute pleasure to be able to line up Dr. Humphrey Pullen to uh, assist us with a, uh, uh, an overview on hemochromatosis, okay? And just for those of you that um, haven't crossed paths with Dr. Pullen, just a little bit of a bio, just to have a little bit of a flavor for his background. Um, Dr. Pullen is an experienced hematologist with a special interest in hematological malignancies, including lymphoma and autologous bone marrow transplantation and some other uh, rare uh, blood, blood diseases as well. Uh, as part of his uh, Waikato DHB responsibilities, uh, he, he has served on the Waikato and Lakes populations via the Waikato Hospital and the Rotorua Hospital Hematology Outreach since 92. He's also been involved in community laboratory work in Hamilton since 1994. And in recent times, uh, since uh, 2012, he was appointed as a uh, part-time medical director for the Midland Cancer Network. And uh, as a result of that, he, he, he had been appointed to the Ministry of Health Cancer Treatment Advisory Group and uh, is now involved in, or has been involved in helping to develop the lymphoma uh, tumor standards for New Zealand. So uh, with that, and to everyone on behalf of our LBC uh, patient community, uh, absolute honor. And uh, Dr. Pullen, great to have you on our uh, webinar series. And uh, I think with that, I'll, I'll hand it off to you knowing that, hey, we have a chance to get a few questions answered after, after you go through some of the slides. So thank you once again. Kia ora and uh, welcome. And thank you, Matthew, for that introduction. Um, we're just going to share screen now so that you can see my slides. Um, and I hope that happens uneventfully. I'll give you the thumbs up when it's looking, looking good. All right, so this afternoon, this evening, whenever you're watching this, um, we're talking about hereditary hemochromatosis. Um, and I thought just to reinforce what Matthew said, that I'm based here at uh, the Waikato Hospital. And here's a lovely picture of the hospital uh, in an autumn, uh, autumn evening with Mount Parongia in the background, Hamilton Lake, you can see in the foreground. So that's where I've worked, as Matthew has said, for, for many years now. So first of all, just to start off, uh, what is hemochromatosis? Um, most of you may know that it's an autosomal recessive genetic disorder, and uh, we'll come to that a bit more later on. And it's particularly common in Northern European descent. And that's part of the reason why I'm wearing my uh, tartan tie today. I don't know whether you can see that on the screen, um, but this is a, a Hamilton clan tartan reflecting my own uh, Northern European and Scottish descent. Um, so just to reinforce that, uh, mostly we see hemochromatosis in Caucasian people. And what does hemochromatosis do? What does the genetic disorder uh, result in? Well, it causes an excessive absorption of iron from the diet. So iron is absorbed in the proximal small bowel. So just after it comes our food comes through the stomach and duodenum it then goes into the small bowel and it's in that area that iron is absorbed from our diet and normally we absorb about 10 percent of the iron that we eat in our food people with hemochromatosis however absorb 30 or 40 percent of the iron that uh, is in their diet so a lifelong uh, increased absorption of iron which comes into the body, circulates around the body, and over time is deposited in various tissues. And the important thing about hemochromatosis is if it is left undiagnosed or not, not diagnosed, 
and therefore not treated, the buildup of iron and the various tissues and organs in the body can result in serious long-term damage. And that's why it's very important to know if there is a family history of hemochromatosis and to screen family members. There are various types of hemochromatosis that you can see listed on the slide, but by far the most common type is type one, which is related to the HFE gene. And we'll talk about that a bit more shortly. But it's also just worth knowing that there are other types of hemochromatosis that are very rare. The juvenile hemochromatosis variants are very uncommon indeed, but they, as the name implies, present in childhood with iron overload occurring very early in life. And then there are types three and four, which we very occasionally see, um, uh, but are very uncommon. So moving on to the type one uh, variant of hemochromatosis associated with the HFE gene. As I've said, it's a common genetic condition amongst Caucasians. And if you look at Caucasian populations, uh, one in 200 people are genetic carriers of hemochromatosis. So it's a very common gene to be carrying. But the fact that you have to be autosomal recessive to actually manifest the disease means that you have to inherit two copies of mutant HFE genes, one from each parent. So you have to have both parents that are genetic carriers and they each pass on a mutant gene to you to get hemochromatosis. And how do we suspect hemochromatosis? Well, it's often suspected with a blood test. And when you do the blood test, you particularly look at the serum ferritin level, the ferritin being an iron storage protein that goes up with increased iron in the body and drops with low iron levels in the body. So in hemochromatosis being an iron excess problem, the ferritin level is high. And if we do iron studies, which measure the blood level of iron and the amount on the carrier protein transferrin, we find that the iron saturation level or the amount of iron that the iron carrier protein transferrin is carrying is high. So it's the combination of a high serum ferritin level with a high iron saturation level that alerts us to the possibility of hemochromatosis. If you don't see that pattern, hemochromatosis is very unlikely. And there are a large number of causes of high ferritin levels without having a high iron saturation that are not related to hemochromatosis and iron excess. So that's one of the things that sometimes general practitioners have trouble sorting out. But when we're dealing with somebody with hemochromatosis, the high ferritin level reflects the amount of iron in their body. So the higher the ferritin level, the longer they've been stacking away iron and the more iron that is built up in their system. So that's why we can use the ferritin level as a marker of hemochromatosis. And it tells us how we're getting on when we start treatment. There are a number of genetic tests that we can do to confirm the diagnosis of hemochromatosis, and they look for the specific mutations in the HFE gene. And there are three mutations that the laboratories commonly test for, C282Y, H63D, and S65C that you can see on the slide. And by far the most common and by far the most important is the C282Y mutation. So here's a uh, schema of the chromosome six on the left-hand side. You can see here uh, a diagram of the chromosome um, with the short arm up here and the long arm down here, what we call the, the P arm and the Q arm. 
And everybody uh, in the human race has 46 chromosomes, having two copies of the 23 chromosomes. And they are numbered one through to 23. And obviously we're dealing with chromosome six today. So it's on chromosome six that the HFE gene sits and you can see it marked there. And the HFE gene is very close to the HLA gene that determines tissue type. So we've known about HLA genes for a long time, but the HFE gene wasn't discovered until 1996. So since then, we've been able to do genetic testing for hemochromatosis. And when you do a genetic test, this is the sort of report that the doctor gets back. And you can see here, they've tested for the C282Y mutation and they've found that this person is homozygous for the C282Y mutation. So that means they've inherited two copies of that mutant gene. So each of their two parents has passed on a C282Y mutant gene to this person. And this particular person didn't have any abnormalities of the H63D or S65 genes. Now, in terms of how does the gene matter? Well, the gene matters because the genetic profile of this particular gene on the chromosome makes a specific protein. And this down here is a schema of that particular protein. And here's the um, cell membrane and this protein that sticks out of the cells. And you can see here is marked where the abnormality occurs if people inherit the C282Y mutation. Whereas the other two mutants that we test for, H63D and S65C, the abnormalities occur up here in this loop part of the protein. So these specific mutations uh, do affect how that HFE protein is made. And if this protein is made abnormally, then it results in increased iron absorption from the proximal small bowel. So when you look at um, patient, uh, groups of people with hemochromatosis, so this is a number of papers that have been published previously looking at uh, groups of patients with hemochromatosis, some from America, some from France and Australia and so on, you can see some from Germany. And you can see the number of hemochromatosis patients that they looked at. And then they said, all right, all of these people have got hemochromatosis with high iron levels. What's their genetic makeup? And here you can see, looking across the percentages, how the vast majority of hemochromatosis patients, 83% up to 100%, have C282Y2 copies, or homozygous C282Y, all right? But there are a proportion of patients with hemochromatosis who have some combination that's different from that. So sometimes you can get C282Y with H63D. So there's a small percentage of patients with that sort of makeup. And sometimes you can get um, other abnormalities, two copies of H63D, for instance. All right. S65C isn't mentioned on this slide, but um, I think the important message is to say that most people with type one hereditary hemochromatosis, we're likely to find homozygous C282Y as the most common genetic defect. So I've talked about how the defect in hemochromatosis is excess iron absorption from the small gut, a small uh, intestine. And here's a picture of a cell lining the uh, small intestine with the food coming along up here and the iron being picked up by the special protein on the surface of the light, the surface lining of the, of the cells in the small intestine, bringing the iron into that cell and then it being released into the circulation through this ferroportin channel. And so it's this part of the uh, iron absorption pathway that is abnormal in patients with hemochromatosis with excess iron being sucked in and pushed through into the circulation. Now, once 
the iron is coming in through the intestine, it enters the bloodstream where it circulates. And a lot of iron is found in hemo hemoglobin within the red blood cells. And that's why blood specialists get involved with hemochromatosis. But some of the iron is stored in the liver, in the liver cells, what are called hepatocytes. And some of it is stored in the spleen and what we call macrophage cells. So macrophages are cells that are part of the immune system, but they also store iron. And there's a system called the reticuloendothelial system that is in the spleen and bone marrow. And that uh, is part of the iron stores in the body. And the point is that when a person becomes deficient in iron, iron can be released from these stores and uh, circulate around the body and be used by the blood factory in the bone marrow to make good blood cells and so on. And at the same time, the um, absorption of iron from the, the diet can be adjusted slightly with iron deficiency and in iron excess, it can be wound down slightly. But the problem in hemochromatosis is that the iron adjustment part of the absorption of iron from the diet is faulty and the person just keeps on sucking in more iron from their diet regardless. So that gives you an idea about iron metabolism within the body. Uh, we do have a lot of iron in our blood cells and that's important in terms of how we treat uh, iron uh, overload. So in terms of how can uh, hemochromatosis affect people? Well, the answer is early on, it hardly affects people at all. And this is a graph showing a person with hemochromatosis who's born at age zero, obviously, and slowly ages through the decades, 10, 20, 30, 40, and so on. And as they get older, they start building up excess iron. And this red line is the ferritin level. And you can see that they go through childhood and uh, as they enter their 20s, the iron level really starts to rise. And bear in mind that the upper limit of normal ferritin level is around about 450 to 500. So once they're at the arrow point, they're starting to get excess iron into their body. So that's, you know, in their, tw in their 20s, really. And that starts building up and building up. And then once it, they're over a thousand for, for their ferritin level, they start stacking iron away into their organs. And so tissue injury and organ injury starts developing. And if they haven't been diagnosed by the time they're into their 40s and 50s, we're worried that they're going to get liver damage and potentially cirrhosis of the liver. So that's what we want to prevent. So ideally, we want to diagnose somebody with hemochromatosis you know, before they get to the thousand level, certainly. So we want to diagnose them around about here, all right? And certainly if there's a family history, we want to pick them up before they start really building up their iron levels. So you can see the stages of hemochromatosis over here to the left. Um, you've got the genetic mutation, but it's not causing any symptoms. Slowly you're building up iron within your body. So there's biochemical evidence. If we do a blood test, we can see it, uh, uh, excess iron coming. And then iron overload starts to cause non-specific symptoms, tiredness, lethargy, lack of concentration, concentration. And then the buildup of iron becomes uh, more severe to the point where organs start becoming damaged. So, that gives you an idea of how hemochromatosis can affect somebody, particularly if it's undiagnosed and untreated. So as I've mentioned, end organ damage is what we want to try and prevent. And what sort of end organ damage are we talking about? Well, I've listed it on, on this slide. Liver disease particularly starts off with fibrosis and scarring in the liver with high iron levels and that can progress to cirrhosis. And anybody with cirrhosis of the liver has increased risk of what's called hepatocellular carcinoma, HCC. And that's really a, where you get a tumor developing or a cancer developing within the liver. Not a good thing. 
If you get iron deposition within the pancreas gland, you can develop diabetes. So that can be a problem. If you get iron deposited in your joints, you can develop significant arthritis and, and uh, arthropathy with, with pain and deformity of joints. And the iron deposition within joints and hemochromatosis can particularly affect these knuckles across the hand, what we call the metacarpophalangeal joints or MCP joints, and in particular, the second and third joints. So here's somebody's normal hand alongside somebody with a hemochromatosis hand, and you can see these swollen uh, metacarpophalangeal joints developing because of iron deposition within the, the joints of the hand. You can also get pigmentation of the skin with a bronzed appearance. And if you look at these two hands, this is the skin of somebody with hemochromatosis, much darker and more bronzed in appearance. And you can get deposition of iron into the gonads. So that's the sex uh, uh, organs. So ovaries and testes particularly. And if you get um, iron deposition uh, in the pituitary gland, which is the major hormone gland that controls hormones around the body, you can get what's called erectile dysfunction where men cannot develop an adequate erection and it really affects their sex life. So all of those things are complications of iron excess. And they're the things that we ask hemochromatosis patients about, whether they've developed anything like these sorts of problems. And if they have, we need to start to deal with them. In order to assess iron overload in the liver, occasionally we do a liver biopsy. And this next slide is a, a picture taken down the microscope of liver tissue that's been biopsied. And here are some you know, liver cells that have got all these black blue dots, which are iron within them. And if we look at a higher power, we can see the nucleus of the liver cells, these little pink uh, fried eggs, if you like, but within uh, purple fried eggs rather, but within the pinker uh, cytoplasm of the liver cell, you can see this brown pigment, which is the iron, which has been deposited within the liver. And again, if we stain this up with a special pearl stain, we can see the blue black color reflecting the iron within these liver cells. So doing a liver biopsy is an invasive procedure, it has to be done under ultrasound guidance, uh, pushing a, a, a biopsy needle into the liver tissue itself and taking a little core out. But it is very, very helpful in terms of deciding has there been excess iron deposited within the liver? And if there has, how much damage has that done to the liver structure and the liver cells themselves? So if you do an ultrasound guided liver biopsy and you ask them to uh, look at the iron level, then they will send you this sort of result where they uh, report um, how much uh, iron is in the sample of liver tissue. And they calculate from that what's called a hepatic iron index, which reflects really the amount of iron per gram of dry tissue per year of life. And if that is 2.0 or above, then hemochromatosis is very likely. So we can use a liver biopsy to confirm a diagnosis of hemochromatosis, but in particular, see whether the iron excess has caused significant damage to the liver tissue. So um, another way of, ex of uh, assessing iron deposition within the liver is to do an MRI scan, so a, new, uh, a magnetic resonance imaging scan. And we can look at the liver with a special protocol and we can see is the pattern of the liver on the MRI scan abnormal? And if it is, how severely abnormal? And that can determine, uh, again, the degree of iron loading and whether the uh, liver is really affected by iron excess. So that just gives you some idea as to the sorts of tests we do for people that come to our clinic with a diagnosis of hemochromatosis. 
and the sort of things we asked them about in terms of seeing how much the iron excess may have affected their bodies. I'll now move on to treatment of hemochromatosis. So firstly, um, treatment is only required if there is clear evidence of increased iron stores. And that's very important because not everyone with the abnormal hemochromatosis genes necessarily develops iron excess in their body. And although you can be homozygous for the C282Y gene or have another combination of HFE gene mutations, and you might look at the result and say, well, you're going to get into trouble with hemochromatosis. In fact, not everyone does. And there are about 20% of people with HFE uh, genetic abnorm abnormalities where we would have thought they would get hemochromatosis, where for some reason they don't. So we need to bear in mind that those people don't need treatment. So we do need to treat the 80% of people that are getting into trouble with uh, iron excess, and we need to wait to see that that is clearly happening. So typically, we will look to see, is the iron building up in that person's body? And we look at the ferritin level, and we say, yes, your ferritin's got over 500. Uh, clearly, you're somebody with the right HFE genetic profile. You're get, getting into trouble. We need to start you on some treatment. So what do we do in terms of treating people with hemochromatosis? Well, the answer is bloodletting or venesection. So by removing blood from a person's body, you can remove iron. And every mill of blood, as I've said there on the slide, contains 0.5 milligrams of iron. So if we uh, venesect or uh, take a pint of blood off people, in fact, 450 mils is the standard amount that we remove. We're removing quite a lot of iron. And we can do that on a weekly basis if we need to. If somebody comes in with hemochromatosis and a very high ferritin level, uh, we ask them to come back every week and have blood taken off. But more commonly, if the uh, ferritin isn't too bad at presentation, we'll just uh, venesect them every two to four weeks uh, and slowly get their iron levels down. And with that, their ferritin will fall. And in terms of what we're aiming to do, well, we will follow the ferritin level down uh, nicely as it comes down, taking you know, each um, bag of blood off, aiming to get the ferritin down to quite a low level. Now, there is still some debate as to how low you need to go, but you know, previously we used to say down to 50, but now we're quite happy with a level down to 100. So that's in the low normal range for a ferritin level. Um, and ideally, and I still believe, we really need to keep the ferritin level at a low, uh, less than 100 level to try and maintain good control of iron stores. So we'll talk a bit more about that. So just to show you a picture of somebody having a venesection or a phlebotomy, so they come into usually a laboratory uh, outlet and they have a needle put in, just like a blood donor is giving blood and usually into a big vein in their inside of their elbow. And that drains blood straight out through the tubing down into a bag. And the bag uh, fills to about 450 mils. And the principle of doing a venesection is that by taking blood away, the bone marrow, the blood factory says, hey, this, this person hasn't got enough red blood cells in their body now. I better crank up my red cell production. And in so doing, by cranking up the red cell production, the bone marrow uses more iron from the iron stores in that person. So by taking blood away and the bone marrow cranking up red cell production, the iron stores are uh, slowly being chipped away and slowly reduced and brought down to normal levels. So a few pointers about um, venesection and uh, how to make that um, a success and not a trial 
for you in terms of a hemochromatosis patient. So the first golden rule is always make sure you're warm and well hydrated. So you've had some a, a good amount to drink beforehand and you don't walk into the venous section place freezing cold. So you might need to wear good clothes, stay warm and be well hydrated. And if you are, then your veins will be well dilated and very accessible and it'll be easy to get the needle in. Sometimes after having the blood taken off, people either get up too quickly or even after lying down for a bit after the venous section, they still get up and feel lightheaded and woozy. And that's really just because their body hasn't adjusted to the fact that they've had 450 mils of blood taken away. So if people are very lightheaded after having a venous section, and you know we can't counteract that by giving them a good drink after a venous section and replacing the volume of fluid, then sometimes we have to cut back the volume that they're being venous sected. So sometimes instead of having 450 mils removed, we have to say, well, look, you're running into trouble with dizziness. Let's just take 250 mils off. Um, so it's not such a trial for you. So sometimes people can only cope with having 250 mils of blood taken away each time. And we have to venusect them a bit more often. If people have difficult veins and the phlebotomist has difficulty getting the the 18 gauge needle into a good vein, then sometimes they have to use a small needle and sometimes even what they call a butterfly needle. And if you have to do that and you can't run the blood off into a blood bag, then you can just fill up a lot of blood test tubes. And sometimes just by filling 20 red top tubes, um, you can still uh, get a good volume of blood off. So there are options for people that have difficult veins. Um, and you know I think you need to discuss that with your phlebotomist if you end up having difficult venous sections. Now, once you have had a number of venous sections and your iron stores have been brought back down to normal and the ferritin is down below 100, then the frequency or the, the, the time between venous sections can be spaced out and you don't need to have as many venous sections performed. And typically people with hemochromatosis can get away with having around about three or four venous sections a year and still keep their iron stores under good control. And that's the time that I say to them, particularly if they're young and particularly if they're otherwise healthy, why don't you become a blood donor? And the New Zealand Blood Service, the NZBS, are very welcoming now of people with hemochromatosis uh, becoming blood donors as long as they're otherwise healthy and not taking a lot of medication. So if you have hemochromatosis, uh, particularly if you're a youngish person and particularly if you're very healthy, do become a blood donor because the blood service can use your blood and put it into the donor pool we know that hemochromatosis is a genetic disorder, so it can't be transferred by blood transfusion. And yet we can use your blood to transfuse people in need. So I really do encourage people, particularly once they're only needing three or four venous sections a year, uh, to, to enroll as a blood donor if they possibly can. And then the blood service can keep an eye on your uh, ferritin levels and make sure your hemochromatosis is under good control. Another point is that uh, sometimes if you're having venous sections through a, a community laboratory and so on, you can inadvertently end up being over venous sected. So sometimes the order from your uh, blood doctor might be right, you need a venous section every two weeks. And uh, you go in and every fortnight you're having blood off, blood off, blood off, blood off. But people don't realize that your iron stores are getting low. And if you keep on having venous sections, when your iron stores are really very low, then you'll start to become anemic and develop iron deficiency. And we don't want that. We just want to venous you down to where your ferritin and your iron stores are normal. 
So for that reason, I always advocate that hemochromatosis patients do have a blood test at the same time that they have their venous section so that we can check their hemoglobin level and make sure they're not becoming anemic. Because it's very important that we don't over venosect and very important that we don't make people anemic unnecessarily. So that's something to watch and keep an eye on. So on that note, I'm very keen for um, patients with hemochromatosis to take control of their own disease. And the best way of doing that is to use a venous section diary. And I hope you can see this in the little caption on the side. So these little booklets uh, are put out by um, Leukemia and Blood Cancer Foundation, as you can see with the logo on the front. They're free of charge and they are just a simple uh, tabulated, I better hold it up the right way, tabulated um, table really, where you can write in the results of your blood tests. You can write in what your ferritin level is, what your hemoglobin level is, and you can write in how much you, you had venosected at that time. And there's a little um, box there for comments or troubles or any issues that you may have had at the time of venosection. So I really encourage you to take control of your own uh, management of your hemochromatosis, to use a diary, record what's going on, to always get access to your blood test results so you can monitor your levels and you can see how your disease is doing. And if, uh, if you need to get a hold of a venous section diary, do contact uh, LBC and they can send one out to you or send several out to you so that you've always got one on hand and you can keep track of your disease and how you're doing. And when you go and see your GP or your own doctor, you can show them the little diary and show them how you're getting on. And, and they can see, yes, your levels are coming down and yes, things are, are under good control. And that's really, really important. So those are a few clues and a few sort of handy hints, if you like, about venosection and treatment of hemochromatosis. So just a few th other things to say. Um, venosections, I believe, are required long-term. So if you're a hemochromatosis patient, particularly if you're diagnosed in your 20s or 30s, you really need to accept the fact that yes, you will need some venosections to keep the hemochromatosis under control for the rest of your life. But that doesn't mean to say you can't have a break. And you can sometimes have a break of two or three months without any problems and go between venous sections, all right? Um, and sometimes if people are going away overseas or having a long holiday or whatever, um, they can um, you know, stop their venous sections for a time and then get back to it once they, uh, you know, they're, they're back home and their life's back to normal. So don't feel as though you need to organize venous sections while you're away on a long holiday, you don't. You can stop for a while. It doesn't matter if the ferritin builds up a wee bit, you can still come back to it and get it back under control when you're back home. So I think um, that's an important thing to say. Very important that venous sections should not be performed in pregnant women. So if a woman has hemochromatosis and has been on venous sections, don't venosect if you think you might be pregnant. When you're pregnant, you need iron, you need excess iron to pass on to your baby, developing baby in utero. So very important that uh, iron is available to the developing fetus. And likewise, if you're very elderly, and by that I mean 80 plus, then it's not a good idea to have venous sections because older folk are very prone to develop lightheadedness and dizziness after venous sections. And we don't want older folk being venosected, going home, getting dizzy and having falls. And next thing we've, we've got a broken hip and trouble. So I feel that people that, uh, you know, with hemochromatosis, who get to the age of 80, fine just to stop the venous sections. And we don't worry if iron levels build up a wee bit as they get into their 80s. You know, it shouldn't build up to high levels uh, and it shouldn't really affect their life expectancy at, at that age. So, you know, fair enough to stop venous sections once you hit the age of 80, uh, uh, because it's really the, the, the benefits, really the risks are greater than the benefits potentially. 
very occasionally I come across a patient who's got what we call impossible veins. So really terrible veins. They're really struggling to get any blood out from anywhere. And they come along and say, well, what on earth am I going to do? How can I possibly keep my iron levels under control? Well, very occasionally we do look at what's called iron chelation treatment. So iron chelation treatment are drugs that we have to give the person that make them excrete iron in their urine through their kidneys. Those drugs are expensive. They're a hassle to give. They've got significant side effects and they're not readily available through Pharmac funding. So we have to apply for specialist special funding for them. So only very occasionally do we give people with hemochromatosis iron chelation therapy or drugs to make them uh, pee out their excess iron. We really rely on venesection and taking blood off as the cornerstone of treatment for people with hemochromatosis. People often ask me about diet. And I think it's very, very important and a natural thing for people to say, well, should I modify my diet? Should I eliminate iron rich foods? What are the iron rich foods I should go without? My response to that is don't worry about your diet, all right? As long as we do the venous sections, as long as we get the iron stores under control, I'm not really too worried about what you're eating because some of the iron rich foods, particularly red meat, are a good source of protein and are quite acceptable in our diet as long as they're not being you know, consumed to excess. So I don't worry too much about uh, removing iron rich foods from the diet, but do bear in mind, mind that you know, iron rich foods, red meat is number one. Um, the whiter flesh meats, chicken and fish contain much less iron. And in terms of vegetables, it's the green leafy vegetables that contain iron, silver beet, spinach and puha. So those are the foods that um, you know, can contribute to a bit more iron in your diet, but generally I don't worry too much about dietary modification. But the two things I do worry about are multivite tablets that contain iron. I don't want people to take those. And remember, iron is often present in women's multivites. So do check if you're taking vitamin supplements that you're not taking one containing iron. And you should also limit vitamin C consumption. Why? Because vitamin C increases iron absorption in normal people and people with hemochromatosis. So we say to people, don't take more than 500 milligrams of vitamin C daily. We don't want you taking huge quantities because that will only compound the problems of iron excess. So that's just a very important reminder. What about alcohol? A lot of people ask me about alcohol. And again, you know, I'm not too worried about that, but I don't want people drinking to excess uh, and drinking heavily. Why? Because that can damage your liver. And if your liver is already being partially damaged by the iron overload, we don't want to make that worse by causing alcohol related liver disease. So alcohol, yes, you can still have a small amount, but in moderation. And in terms of what things you should drink, well, I particularly tell people to avoid drinking fortified wines and red wine. So sherries and ports do contain excess iron and red wine tends to contain more wine, than, more iron than white wine. So if you're going to drink alcohol, uh, prefer you to, um, have beers and those sorts of beverages or a white wine, uh, and again, not to excess. If you're running into problems with um, joints, and this is one area where sometimes getting iron levels down don't improve, then you need to ask your doctor to uh, refer you through for a joint assessment. And that's either in rheumatology clinic or in the orthopedic clinic if they think you're really in trouble with bad arthritis and might need joint replacement surgery. So those things you don't need to hesitate to ask for if you're in trouble with, with iron damaged joints. And likewise, if you've had problems with uh, low hormone levels and uh, erectile dysfunction, there are certainly things we can do to help with that. Um, testosterone replacement therapy, is readily accessible through most endocrinology or hormone clinics. And we can certainly get you onto that 
to improve erectile function and to, uh, um, you know, if needs be, improve sex life. So um, those sorts of uh, issues, people are sometimes a bit afraid to ask about, but I do encourage you to raise it with your GP and bear in mind that there are certainly things we can do to help if the hemochromatosis is the problem there. All right. In terms of monitoring for liver disease, um, as I've said to you, I mean, we start to get worried about um, iron-related liver disease if the ferritin level is above 1,000 micrograms when you're first diagnosed. And if you are above 1,000 at diagnosis, we particularly want to monitor your liver and keep an eye on it. So we do that by checking alpha feta protein levels, which is just a blood test. And that's a marker that can go up if you start to develop a uh, liver cancer, a hepatocellular cancer. So we keep an eye on that. Early diagnosis, again, the key. And we also do ultrasound scans of the liver because we can uh, gain a lot of uh, information by scanning the liver uh, structure, looking for small tumors if there's any sign of that, but more importantly, looking for scar tissue and cirrhosis on the ultrasound scan. So monitoring for iron-related liver disease, if we think you're at risk of that, is important. We always screen people for diabetes, and we always encourage regular exercise to try and minimize the risk of developing diabetes, and that's very important. And on, in that regard, remember you're much more likely to develop type 2 diabetes if you are overweight and have a high body mass index, BMI. So we want you to avoid becoming overweight. And if you are overweight, you need regular exercise and a dietary program to bring it under control. It is worthwhile discussing with your GP about risk factors for heart attack and stroke. And I mention that because there is a mild association between people that have hemochromatosis and people having a slightly increased risk of a heart attack and stroke. It is only slight, but the things that contribute to heart attack and stroke we need to pay attention to. So those are things like high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol level, smoking, and high body mass index or being overweight. So those things are important for your general cardiovascular health, but they're also important for people with hemochromatosis. The other thing just to mention, and I come across this occasionally, people that are using these diaries are regularly um, sometimes they can be going along with their venous actions, their ferritin levels coming down nicely, 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 down, down, down. And then for some reason, the next test, the ferritin's gone up. And they say, well, hang on a minute. Why has that happened? I've had more blood off. Why has it increased? Sometimes ferritin levels can increase with acute illness. And that particularly means acute infection, inflammation, bad pneumonia, bad chest infection, bad urine infection, if you have a major operation, the ferritin level will go up. And if you develop cancer and some form of liver disease, then the ferritin level can be pushed up independent of what's happening with the iron in your body. So just bear in mind that a slight increase in the ferritin level is not the end of the day. But if it is going up, even though you're having venous actions, you need to get to your doctor. You need to start asking, why is this happening? All right, so do bear in mind that other types of illness, particularly major illness, can increase your ferritin level and can send control of your hemochromatosis uh, haywire. So just bear that in mind. A word about family screening and family testing. Um, you may ask the question, you know, if this is a genetic disorder that's very common in Caucasian populations, why aren't we just doing a blood test on everybody and picking it up early? And that has been looked at and particularly looked at in Australia. But the bottom line is that it's not terribly effective. Genetic testing is expensive. And we also need to bear in mind that only 70 or 80% of those who are genetically at risk actually run into problems with iron excess. So for that reason, routine population screening is not recommended. It has been researched, but it's not advisable. However, and the big however, is family testing of affected people with hemochromatosis 
is really, really important. Strongly recommended. So if you have somebody in your family who's diagnosed with hemochromatosis, it is very important that their first degree relatives are tested. So that means if you're diagnosed in your 20s or 30s, your parents need to be tested, your brothers and sisters or your siblings need to be tested, and any biological children need to be tested. So that's really, really important. And that's what we mean by first degree relatives. People often ask me, how soon should I test my children? Well, I've written there after the age of 16. So very, very occasionally do children under the age of 16 get into trouble with hemochromatosis. The youngest person I've ever looked after was 14 years of age who had a high ferritin level. But most people are well into their 20s by the time they start to build up excess iron in their bodies. So we tend to say 16 and above, yes, test your children. Once people can have a blood test without any drama, very easy to do and very important that it's done. And what sort of testing do we do for those relatives? Well, we do iron studies, a ferritin level, obviously, where we're looking for a high ferritin. And we do do the HFE genetic testing, testing for those three genes that I mentioned earlier. And with those blood tests, we can advise people, have they developed hemochromatosis? Or are they genetically at risk of hemochromatosis? Or are they just a genetic carrier for hemochromatosis? And that's very helpful for them to know. Obviously, if they're genetically at risk of hemochromatosis, we need to monitor them with blood tests and their GP can do that. And if they're found to have hemochromatosis, then we need to discuss with them treatment and how to get treatment underway. So very, very important that first degree relatives are checked out and um, if needs be uh, managed accordingly if they're found to have hemochromatosis as well. So that's all I had prepared to uh, discuss. And uh, I'm now available to talk questions, to take questions. And I'll leave you with this lovely aerial view of the Waikato and Hamilton. You can see in the foreground there, the Hamilton Lake with the hospital on the edge of that, that cluster of buildings is Waikato Hospital. And then in the background, Waikato River coming down and Mount Parongia in the distance on this sublime autumn evening that Matt remembers well, because he used to live here. I, I do, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pullen. Uh, yeah, I do recall running around that lake. Be beautiful, beautiful pick. Hey, great presentation, uh, well delivered and uh, yeah, very clear information. Yeah. So what I'll do, what I'll attempt to do, I'm just gonna, um, I had, there were some patients that had uh, written in prior to this and I'll just try to summarize them, summarize these questions, okay? It's probably about um, five or six, but if we get cut short, we'll just uh, stop there. Now, this is a lady, 78-year-old um, female with, with hemochromatosis, and uh, yeah, it's been six months since her last venous section. But in May, her uh, ferritin was around 50, you know, nanograms per mil, I'll just say 50, and she had a venous section then, in August, she had a level of 30, and then, uh, which was her lowest ever. And then she had another recent ferritin test in November, which was the same level of 30. Uh, she's basically asking, she says, hey, I believe it's not possible for my levels to have remained unchanged over you know, six months. And I really wonder if the ferritin tests have undergone some adjust adjustments recently. She says, the only other reason I can imagine is that all my iron is going into my bones instead. So um, I'm not sure if you had a comment or. Yeah, well, I think the first thing is to ask your doctor about um, the laboratory tests. Um, there is some variation in how different laboratories measure ferritin. Um, so a test from one laboratory might not necessarily correlate with a test from another laboratory. So I think that's the first thing to ask. And sometimes even the same laboratory can change the analyzer in terms of their ferritin uh, method and the method they use to measure the ferritin. So I think those things are important to ask about. Um, 
I wouldn't be too worried with um, a couple of levels of 30. I would certainly um, not be investigating or doing anything further at the moment. And clearly at the moment, you don't need to have any further venous sections. But, you know, I would carry on doing the blood tests and just seeing which way the ferritin is going to go. If the ferritin started to drop without you having venous sections, so if it went from 30, 30 down to 20 or 15 uh, in the next few tests, then I'd be worried that perhaps you were bleeding somewhere and perhaps you were losing blood. And if that's the case, you certainly need investigation and investigation particularly of your bowel. So I think those are the things you need to talk about with your GP and, uh, and go from there. Um, the other thing, as I say, I mean, in the talk, I mentioned how um, venous sections beyond the age of 80 aren't really warranted. And you sound as though you're getting to an age where, you know, you're only needing very spasmodic venous sections and perhaps are reaching a point where you could even stop. So that's my only comment. Mm. I appreciate that one, Humphrey. Uh, another one is uh, I'm a 62 year old male and they had hereditary hemochromatosis for 19 years now. Uh, my question, she says, he, he says, my saturation level is always high, even with maintenance venous sections. Maintenance venous sections keep my uh, hemoglobin and ferritin at normal levels. And this question also came up with some other patient. Uh, he says, should, should I be concerned about the high saturation and is there any other way to lower it other than venous sections? You know, medication or whatever. Well, the short answer is, and my view is quite strongly, no, for goodness sake, don't worry about the iron saturation. Um, iron saturation levels, particularly if the blood test is taken just after food, can be quite high in people with hemochromatosis. But bear in mind, you know, the, the iron saturation is, is fluctuating, it goes up and down from day to day, and really is not a very reliable marker of iron stores. I always say to people, trust the ferritin, trust the ferritin, trust the ferritin. And if your ferritin's under good control and your hemoglobin's satisfactory, I would just carry on doing what you're do, doing and I wouldn't worry about the iron saturation. It's only very occasionally where we feel the ferritin is falsely elevated that we look at the iron saturation as well. But again, a fasting iron saturation level is really mandatory in that context if you're going to use that to help you guide venous section. But I really feel the ferritin is the, is the straightforward marker and that's what 99% of patients should trust. Okay, Pre appreciate that. Uh, there, there's another one, I'm, uh, he's a 66 year old male. He was diagnosed with hemochromatosis 11 years ago. His ferritin was 850 back then. Um, yeah, he goes on extreme tiredness and muscle aches, but are back with a vengeance. My, he says, my ferritin level is up to about 450. Uh, he had written, his GP had written to the hematologist at the hospital and was told the reading was normal, so no treatment. Uh, a couple other doctors have said the same thing. Uh, he says he's been researching this condition on the net and the general information appears that, you know, it's necessary to keep ferritin low with regular venous section, prevent complications as you get older. Uh, he's basically asking, um, uh, he, he was at the doctors and he had, and, and um, he was told that this time the type of hemochromatosis he has is not the serious type and does not require any treatment. And this fella is asking, hey, I just want to know if the lack of medical treatment is due to the lack of funding or that I'm now too old. So he's just sort of talking out loud and asking, you know, he's, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I mean, I think the first thing to say is at a level of 450, he's not going to get into trouble and he's not at risk of developing end organ damage at that level. But having said that, um, you know, I think if he's got some symptoms and perhaps the tiredness and lethargy are partly related to the iron buildup, then it might be quite reasonable to restart a venous section program and to get that ferritin level down uh, to the sort of 100 level. Um, so that's my view. I probably, you know, if you came to my clinic, I'd probably be saying, well, let's get you back onto the venous sections then. Let's, let's bring this ferritin down and see if your symptoms improve. Um, you know, this is where there is a wee bit of controversy about um, do people need to have venous sections all the time versus can they have a break and let the iron level build up again 
and then restart. Um, you know, if, if it was me and I was in control of my own disease, I'd rather just chip away at it regularly um, and keep it under good control rather than sort of doing these seesaws of getting the ferritin down to a low level and then building up and then going again and up and down and up and down. Um, so that's my personal view. I probably would restart him on venous sections, but I certainly would reassure him at 450, he's not running into end organ problems at that level. Okay, yeah, appreciate that, Humphrey. Hey, now this, this one is a, is a 60 year old female um, homozygote, you know, double homozygote, sorry, homozygous, yeah, was diagnosed 15 years ago. Uh, they have three monthly iron study blood tests to check her, her levels. At the moment, she has one venous section per year, though it's in the past, it's been twice a year. Uh, she goes on some other details, but she says, hey, you know, I've had a, um, a maybe you know what this is, a quantifurin TB gold test in December of two, 2017. Should these be done yearly, that type of a test? I'm not sure what that test is. So quantifurin gold is a test that's done for occult tuberculosis. Um, and unless she's got a history of, of tuberculosis or they're worried about her being at risk of tuberculosis, I wouldn't be doing a quantifurin gold. Um, so I think that's not really relevant to the hemochromatosis discussion. If she's only requiring um, one venous section a year, that's fine. If that's all she needs to keep her iron levels under control. Um, I don't know what age this lady is, um, but Certainly, if she's still in the premenopausal oh, age. 60, 60, sorry, 60. Okay. So yeah. she's postmenopausal. Okay. So, um, but just bear in mind that if you're premenopausal, then with the monthly period, people often don't require much venous section to keep their iron levels under control. But look, this lady may only have, you know, a mild effect from her abnormal hemochromatosis genes. And uh, one venous section a year is enough to keep her iron levels under control. And if so, that's great but most people require a bit more than that. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Uh, just over to the, there's another lady that wrote in and uh, she did ask about the donating of blood and it, it sounds like you, yeah, you did cover that with the NZ blood service, so thank you. But her second question had to do with, um, I'm also wanting to know, you know what is considered acceptable, acceptable levels before venous section is done and, and why those levels? I know you kind of covered that um, she says, uh, I, I've been told by my doctor that the acceptable, acceptable level has increased quite a bit since I was diagnosed. So I'm still in the acceptable range, but my iron is now much higher than when I first had a venous section years ago. Uh, the new levels apparently are much higher than the standard and insurance companies will not insure me at those levels. I'm not sure if you had a comment. Yeah. Well, again, this, this gets back to the, the sort of mild controversy about what is an acceptable level in terms of what sort of target ferritin level people with hemochromatosis should be aiming for. Um, as I've said in the talk, I mean, I still um, subscribe to the view that if you can get the iron stores down to a low normal level, then you're really starting to pull iron out of tissues. And to me, that's still important in preventing end organ damage. But there are other people that say, look, once you've done that, you can back off and you can let the ferritin level rise, you know, up to two, three, four hundred without major risk. Um, but then at some point, you're going to have to start re-venusecting again, and you're probably going to have to venusect quite frequently when you do restart. So as I've mentioned, my view is, um, you know, continued venusections, but less often and ideally through blood donation is my preference. Um, so in terms of the insurance company thing, I mean, I haven't had a lot of discussion with them over recent times, but I mean, they may have been sort of told or subscribed to the old um, uh, view that you really had to get the iron levels down to a ferritin even below 50 to be acceptably safe for hemochromatosis. I think we are more relaxed, as I've mentioned, and below 100 to my mind is quite comfortable and quite acceptable. Um, but, you know, as I say, I would still like to see the ferritin in the sort of lower normal range. Uh, really appreciate that. Hey, say, Humphrey, one last question here. Um, 
Uh, this was from a fella. He's uh, 57 years old and uh, yeah, 22 years. He's, he's been diagnosed with yeah, the homozygous uh, HFV uh, hemochromatosis. Now with him, you know, he's been on a, a venous section program and um, you know, it brings everything down. Uh, his serum iron and his normal iron, they're both within normal specifications, uh, but his transferritin is actually below the specifications. And he's just asking, is there anything that can bring that up to a normal level medication or something to concern about? Well, it's not something to be too concerned about is the short answer. Um, a low transferrin we do see, you know, not just in hemochromatosis, but in other disorders as well, um, sometimes in anemias of chronic disease. So, I mean, the transferrin level will again go up and down depending upon how much iron's around and um, how much iron there is to pick up. But I wouldn't worry too much about the transferrin level. Again, I, you know, encourage this person to focus back on their serum ferritin and to follow that as the primary marker of their disease. Um, you know, as I've said, I, I, I still think fundamentally that's the most important thing. Okay, yeah, I'll appreciate that. Nothing magical we can do to make his transferrin come up really. His, his own oh. body's got to do that. Okay, okay, yeah. I'll, I'll let him know. And, yeah. and if it stays low, it's not a major. Mm. Okay, All yeah. right. I appreciate that. Say, so, I know we've finished with the questions. Uh, one brief thing here that I will do for our uh, viewer audience. And Humphrey, thanks for sharing our venous section and our, um, our hemochromatosis booklet. I found, uh, so I just wanna put this out there and flag this with our uh, viewing audience on the webinar. Just in the last 12 months, we revised this. So it's a much easier, um, you know, A4 double-sided uh, fact sheet. It's been reviewed by the hematologist. So. If you're seeing this and you haven't received this to your house, let us know. We'll uh, just contact us and we'll, we'll send it out for you. Uh, just to yeah. check, check notes. Well, uh, I think that's probably our, our point to wrap it up. And uh, I've got to say just massive, massive thank you to you, Humphrey. Uh, we, as in the LBC patient community and our staff, appreciate you putting in the time taking time out of your day on this uh, Tuesday and just uh, yeah, spending it with us and sharing the overview on hemochromatosis. So, uh, well, thank you, Matthew, and thank you for the opportunity to, to present. Okay, mm. all righty. All right, well, go well and take care. Thank you so much.